Hello and welcome to our space webinar on sustainable growth and soaring success for franchisors. Thank you all for joining. Um, in a second, you'll see our lovely speakers. I have two great speakers today that are joining me. These are Valerie Kozaev and Elias Ayat, who will be joining um, the discussion. And we're going to discuss um, best practices and tips on how to grow your franchise successfully um, and uh, for the long run. Without further ado, I'm going to uh, share my slides and I will then um, invite our lovely speakers to join us. Um, I'm here today to talk about a model that I've developed um, a few years ago uh, that has helped dozens of franchisors around the world achieve success and um, growth of their franchise and even exceed their own expectations. The model is called the five F's of franchise marketing. A little bit of information about myself. I am the founder and CEO of a company called Franchise Fame, and we are a franchise marketing agency that works globally with clients from all over the world, some of who count more than 2,600 locations. Um, I am also a best-selling author. Uh, last month, I published my first book, which is also called Franchise Fame, and within a couple of days of its publishing, it became an Amazon bestseller. Uh, I hold a BSc in business and economics and a master's in project management. And I have an, more than 14 experience now, years of experience now in the franchising and marketing sectors. Um, without further ado, this is my book, Franchise Fame. Um, it talks a lot, a lot about my experience in the franchising industry. I myself um, have led the marketing and branding teams of a global franchisor. And then I moved away and became a franchisee myself. So I've sold the two sides of the coin and that's how I got the idea to uh, move away. And, and I founded the agency for franchise marketing, challenging the pain points that I've seen most franchisors experience. My book is available on Amazon and all major book retailers. So if you'd like to grab your copy, please feel free to. So, um, as I said, Franchise Fame is a global franchise marketing agency. We've got clients in over 53 countries on five continents. So all the learning and the method methodology that you're going to hear about just now has been built um, and tested and trialed over the years with um, different franchisors in different sectors and in different markets as well. And if the model is implemented correctly, it works 100 in 100% of the cases. Um, we are an award-winning team. I'm especially proud to say that this year we snatched the Global Franchise Award for the best PR and marketing agency. And over the years, we've been nominated and won numerous awards as well. Uh, I owe this to the great team behind me as well. So what are the three major franchise or pain points that most franchisors um, come across in their franchising journey? First of all, they often feel that the franchise is invisible. Once you've done all the franchising, the paperwork, the legal side of it, writing the franchise operations manuals, the franchisee manuals and all that, uh, you expect to have a huge queue at the end of the day of people that want to invest in your franchise, but very often that's not the case. The expectations versus reality, that picture shows what I mean. The second problem is usually the lack of time because franchisors often fall in the trap of thinking they can do it all by themselves. They have been successful so far in their business as solo entrepreneurs or just a regular business with a team. But a lot of the, in a lot of the times, franchisors think that they are the best people to do a task. So they end up having a lot of on their plate and not enough time to complete all the tasks. And the third problem is lead generation. And we've all heard about this. It's almost as if lead generation is this mystical thing where you almost need a crystal ball and some spells to actually get the right leads. It's not really that complicated, but a lot of franchisors get frustrated, try different channels, different approaches, burn a lot of cash on it and are not successful. I've heard that um, from almost every franchise client that I've worked with over the years. 
So combined, the result of all of this is the franchise are usually working their hardest, investing their the longest of hours and not making uh, a big um, difference and not making progress in their business. This can be a very frustrating spot. It can also be a very lonely place. So this is why I've developed the five F's of franchising model that actually meets and addresses those pain points and provides a solution for each one of them. Um, this is a summary of the model. The five F's of franchise marketing um, consists of fantastic reputation, franchise network, focused team, full funnel, and finding the right fit. I'm just going to say a couple of sentences for each point, and then I'm going to pass it on to our um, guests and presenters to talk in a little bit more depth about any uh, all of these points. So a fantastic reputation is, is incredibly important for every business, more so for a franchise to look after and manage their reputation because you can't expect to have poor reputation or negative press from a franchisee that exited your business and expect to add more business partners to your network and sell more franchises. It's unrealistic. This is why Fantastic reputation is the first point from the F five Fs model, and it's incredibly important that if you don't have a practice in place to put such um, in right away, and to make sure that you're active not only about monitoring but also managing your reputation, whether to encourage franchisees and, and clients to leave positive reviews for you, or to be on the lookout for any negatives, respond the right way, and so on. Point two, franchisee network. This is the network of already existing partners that you've got your franchisees without whom you can't be successful. You're only successful if your franchisees are successful. So having a process in place to support them throughout their journey, not only when you onboard them, but actually throughout their journey to make sure that they are successful, they are growing with your business. That means you're also growing yourself. So franchisees have a very important uh, part of of the um, success process and a franchise or cannot be successful without their network being successful. Point three is dedicated to a focus team. And this is the corporate team or the head office team, the team that a very successful franchisor must have around them. You won't be able to do it all by yourself. Maybe with the pilot store and a couple of other franchisees, perhaps yes. But then once your network starts growing and if you have ambitions to grow your franchise, you would need that support staff and help, whether that's an operations manager, a marketing manager, additional team, make sure you surround yourself with A players and um, people who exceed and are knowledgeable in their fields and sectors in order for you to um, um, reach success. Point four is all about full funnel because uh, in order for you to grow, you need to have a full funnel of leads of people who would like to buy into your business. And the funnel should be full with high quality, relevant leads of people that actually want to partner with you. So point four and chapter four in the book talks about how to get that full funnel of leads and generate um, traction and um, for the most cost effective and in the most cost effective ways. And lastly, the last point five is about finding the right fit or amongst all these candidates and applicants and prospective franchisees, how do you actually find the ones that are suitable for your business? Because a lot of franchisors think that almost everyone is suitable to buy into their business model, but that's a mistake. You need to find the right fit for your business to guarantee yourself success. So this is my model. If you'd like to learn a little bit more, uh, you can buy my book from Amazon or you can connect with me on social media and um, send me a DM so that I can send you the digital copy of the book. Without further ado, I'd like to present our next speaker. This is Elias Ayat. He will, will, he will be talking about one of the five Fs in more detail. Uh, a little bit about Elias. He joined Mailboxes Etc. in 2019. His role is uh, international development of the NBE brand in Africa and Asian markets, as well as the GCC countries. Um, and he um, is responsible for all the master licensee agreements in that sector. Also, he supports the existing master franchises globally through ongoing training and support. 
So Elias, without further ado, please uh, share your slides. Thank you. Hello everyone and greetings from, uh, from Barcelona. Can you hear me well? Very I good. Can hear, I can hear you perfectly fine. Perfect, let me share the presentation. Very good. So normally you should be able to see it. So hello everyone. Um, first of all, before kicking off the, the presentation, just wanted to, to thank Danny for, for the introduction and also congratulate you for the, for the great achievement. Uh, I think this is a, this is a super, good, uh, um, super good thing and the, the success is all deserved. So congratulate you, congratulations. So before getting into the presentation of the importance of the franchise network, uh, I'll just quickly introduce Mailbox, etc. So we are a network of uh, international centers which provide different types of solutions uh, and these centers are owned and managed by entrepreneurs. Okay, The main thing you, you should keep in mind about these solutions is that they are personalized and flexible depending on the needs of the companies, the businesses uh, we work with. We mainly offer five types of solutions in our centers. You can see pack and ship. So for example, if companies need to ship uh, parcels, documents, spare parts or whatever, we are able to do it for them and also to pack uh, properly their, their items. Then we also offer logistic solutions, which is really a growing service uh, where we, we've seen uh, an important uh, growth, especially during COVID. Essentially, logistic solutions are outsourced solutions for people and businesses that have an online shop. Okay, so we talk about storing their products at the MB center, preparing the orders, shipping it, managing the returns, etc. And as you can imagine, during COVID, uh, the growth of the e-commerce was quite uh, important. So we also saw uh, this, uh, this growth in terms of logistics needs. Then we offer domiciliation and mailbox rental services, print and marketing solutions. So think about the companies that needs to uh, either design their communication materials and also print them. So this is a very vertical, these are two vertical services because there are many different options, uh, but keep in mind the design part and the print part. A bit of history about mailboxes, etc. So if you don't know the brand, it was initially founded in the US in 1980 uh, and then introduced in, uh, in Europe with Italy as the first country in 1993, okay? Today, we have a presence in more than 45 countries. We have a network of more than uh, 1,800 centers. And you can see here the number of business customers because we essentially work with B2B clients, even though we also serve the B2C ones. But as you can imagine, the B2B clients, they have more recurrent needs and the solutions we offer are essential business, uh, uh, business needs. And lastly, you can see the revenue uh, generated at the, the level of the group last year. So uh, I wanted to give you a quick introduction about our development in the Middle East. Uh, we've always considered this region as um, a region full of potential, okay? Many countries of the region are taking new policies to diversify the economy, to promote franchising, as franchising is a great uh, added value to, to bring traction and to, to, to boost the economy. So we, we really developed our, our, we really launched our, our development in the region back in 2019, okay? So we were looking for a master franchisee because this is the way we expand our network. Okay, so we look for a master franchisee. This master franchisee will be uh, the exclusive representative of MB in his country. And his goal will be to introduce the brand and then develop it uh, within his territory. Okay, so lastly, as you can see, um, in 2021, we signed a master franchise agreement with a successful entrepreneur 
uh, which covers in total seven countries of the Middle East. So Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar, Kuwait, Bahrain, Oman, and Jordan. And the good thing is that the master franchisee has a really ambitious plan. Okay, they will open first in the UAE um, as a way to kick off the project. They will open two centers, one in Shams, Sharjah Media City, and the other one in Dubai. And over time, they will develop and expand into the other countries of the region. But it's really good at the end that they have good plans of, uh, of development fueled by, uh, by ambition and by a great vision. And I think this is a good transition to the point Danny was mentioning before, which is the importance of the franchise network. Because if I will have to summarize the franchise ecosystem and the different relationships between the, uh, the, the parties involved, I will say that it's a mutual effort which ends to a mutual benefit at the end. So, of course, it's really important to have good franchises because the implications are quite numerous, okay? And uh, if managed positively, it can have a great impact, but on the other side, uh, if it's a negative impact, it can strongly affect the business. Keep in mind that the franchise agreement, they have a duration which varies between five to 10 years. So it can be five, seven, or 10 years. So at the end, uh, if you have bad franchises, they will affect in a bad way the, 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 the brand, the company itself for a long term. Okay, here you can see the impacts among others. Huh? First of all, the brand, the brand reputation. In our case, as I told you, we develop our network for master franchise agreement. So if we have a bad master franchise in his country, it will affect in a really bad way the, the, the reputation of MB. And in our case, we're talking about a country, not a single unit, which is one store, uh, but a whole country. So it can affect the development uh, of our network into the country. It can affect the development of our network into new countries. So at the end, uh, um, it's something to be, to be really managed properly. Then it affects also the revenue of the, of the franchisor. As you know, the franchisor perceives royalties and other fees from the franchisee or the master franchisee. And if this master franchisee is bad and doesn't reach the, the goals in terms of turnover or, or uh, development of the, of the network, of course, it will affect the, the revenue of the, of the franchisor, the headquarter the network and the franchise development, because when you're dealing with candidates interested into opening their own location or acquiring the master franchise, the thing they will, they will vet and they will, uh, they will really analyze are your business cases, which means the other franchises of the network, the other franchises in the other countries. And essentially, if they see that their development is super bad, the management is not good, there are bad, bad articles uh, available online or whatever, they will be much less likely to sign a contract with you and join your, your network. So we can say to, to sum up that it affects the franchise sustainability in the long run. Now, you might think what's needed to have a successful franchise network well, it depends on many different factors, but if I had to, to summarize the, the most important points, I would say uh, that first of all, a big part of it happens even before the signature of the contract, okay? Which is linked to the qualification process. So the qualification process is the process you will follow with a candidate interested into, into opening his own uh, MB center or becoming a master franchisee. And essentially, it's a way for you to really determine if the guy or the lady is the right person to develop your brand uh, into his country. Some franchisors might think in terms of quantity, might be really in a hurry to sign with the first candidate, but this is not the right approach. Because as I was saying before, the, the agreements are quite long. So at the end, uh, you might be you might be really in a hurry to sign a contract with the first candidate that comes, 
but on the flip side you will have to deal with him or her during uh, five seven or ten years so really the 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 qualification process is really important and valerie uh, will uh, will give you more details about it so i won't uh, spoil you but it's mainly about determining if the if the profile of the candidate is the proper one so you analyze the background the skills uh, the motivation the vision the ambition then we have the know-how which is very important uh, I think this is the most valuable thing a franchisee can get from a franchisor, okay? It's not only valid for MB, it's valid for all the franchisors of the, of the ecosystem. And it is um, a key factor to boost the development of the franchisee or master franchisee and to make it less risky, okay? So when we say know-how, we mean all the operational manuals, we mean all the marketing and promotional materials, the best practices, uh, and so on and so on. And this know-how is transferred during the initial and ongoing training, okay? Uh, the initial training in our case is four weeks and the ongoing training is during the whole duration of the, of the agreement. And of course, lastly, we always strive to, to, to to be better on a daily basis with our master franchises so there is this phase of continuous improvement because we we always learn at the end this continuous improvement is only made possible if you define a structure to keep track of the development of the of your franchises there is a quote from peter drucker which i really like which says if you can't measure it you cannot improve it and it's 100 percent true so here there are two main goals the first one is to define goals okay there are different goals that you can uh, that you can define in our case uh with the master franchisees for example when we build the business plan even before signing the contract but we define a development schedule which means that uh, we define the number of openings during the 10 years of the master franchise agreement so this is a goal for example there are also some financials or or sales goals okay which uh, which uh, you should establish with the franchisee really to define the turnover they should achieve in 2022 in 2023 and so on and so on with a growth of course and um so yeah one thing is to define the goals the other thing is to define the kpis because the kpis is really the scale that allows you to 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 determine if the if the goal if the target is achieved or not okay so i was mentioning just before the the, the development schedule the number of openings which is something we can consider as a goal uh, to achieve, for example, five openings in 2022, there are many different things you should do. So there are different steps that the master franchisee should take. So for example, the number of meetings with the, the valid candidates, the number of prospection actions, and so on and so on. This is the same for the, um, the financial KPIs, uh, the financial goals. So if for this year we plan to reach X uh, euros as a goal we need to do many different types of things to get i don't know 20 customers to get these 20 customers we need to do uh, 10 sales meetings to get the 10 sales meetings we need to do cold calling door-to-door -door visits and so on and so on so keep in mind that at the end we have these goals which are complemented by the sub goals and all of this you can measure it with the kpis which are which are crucial and it's part at the end of the strategy the strategic aspects of the of the business not only in franchising but for every uh, business so uh, i wanted to give you an illustration to to conclude and close my uh, my presentation essentially by showing you the different types of activities uh, we organize with our master franchisees in order to, uh, to, to achieve this continuous improvement and to have successful franchises. So this is, for example, the initial training that we organize, which lasts, uh, as I was saying before, four weeks, and during which we share a lot of know-how. 
as soon as the master franchisee opens his, his first store, so the pilot store, uh, we go in his country, we spend one week with them, and we really try to, to, to analyze the way they are doing things to see if at the end they understood uh, properly the content, the know-how from, the, from the, um, the initial training, and really to give them recommendations. So to identify areas of improvement for their, for for them, sorry, to to become better. We also have the regional meetings. So essentially, these are uh, meetings we organize uh, several times in the year. We gather with different master licenses from a specific region, and during two to three days, we we share a lot of know-how. And it's also the occasion for us to track the KPIs, the goals, and to see how things are going. And finally, we also have the convention. Uh, I, did not I did not tell you this at the beginning, but Mailbox, etc., is part of a group called MB Worldwide, composed of different brands. So you have Mailbox, etc., you have uh, Postnet, Alpha Graphic, PrestaShop, and other entities that we, that we acquire. And um, every two years, we organize a convention. We gather all the people from the different brands and we pull the know-how, we pull the knowledge during uh, a few days. So it's a great occasion to, to, to again, uh, becoming better and, uh, and uh, improving the, the quality of the network in general. This is it from my, uh, from my side. I just quoted Dani Peleva because I really like this, uh, this, uh, this quote from her book which says ultimate, ultimately the success of your franchise of your franchisee is your success and vice versa. So as I could explain you during the presentation, this is 100% uh, true. As a last point, I leave you my contact details because uh, as I told you at the beginning, now we have a master franchisee for the seven countries of the Gulf region. Of course, he will have to develop uh, these countries. So he will, either look for area franchises or individual franchises. So in case you are in one of these countries and interested to, to get more information, you can reach me. I will, uh, I will uh, assist you with pleasure. And um, one other thing, we also have countries in North Africa which are still available, such as Tunisia, for example, because we have presence in Egypt, soon in, uh, in another country of the region, but Tunisia, I think, is a country with great potential and, uh, and uh, interesting. So in case you're interested, don't hesitate to, to get in touch with me. So I'm done from my part. Uh, Thank you, Elias. Uh, the presentation has been uh, very informative and uh, useful. And thank you for reinforcing the message of actually having uh, how important it is to have a successful uh, franchisee network in order for the overall success of the franchise or Valerie you raised your hand did you want to ask anything yeah I have a quite interesting question actually for Elias Elias thank you for um, the interesting slides that you showed today you. I'm, I'm, I'm from one franchise expert to another and because we're talking about franchise marketing in particular I'm quite interested to know what was the channel that the lead for the seven countries actually came through was it organically was it through a business directory was it through an and this email? is a very good question <laughs> this is a very good question valerie because i want to use that channel as well yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know i think the 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 middle east is an area where everything is relationship driven okay so you know somebody that can introduce to somebody that can introduce to somebody else. And this is how you build uh, rela business relationships. So this is what happened to us. We signed first a contract for Egypt, okay, with a master franchisee. And this master franchisee from Egypt introduced us to uh, this guy uh, yeah. who was interested in the, in the different yeah. countries. So this is the, the biggest thing I figured out uh, doing the research in this area is that you really need to know people uh, in order to do business. Yeah, 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 I agree. Great. Okay, Thank you, guys. Recommendation is really powerful when it comes to franchise recruitment. And um, a second question, if you don't mind, because it was really interesting for me to kind of find out more about the company. 
is the gentleman with the seven licenses the largest license holder in 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 uh, no, no, no 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 this is also something we we try to develop so essentially we know that in the middle east there are many uh, holdings which are big franchise operators they have more than 50 60 70 brands in their brand portfolio but at the end it was not the case for us but i assume this is a good uh, a good uh, option to to evaluate great thank you thank you dan sorry no about that so uh, thank you, Elias. Uh, Elias uh, reinforced my message about the third point in my book, uh, uh, the successful franchise network and how important this is for the success of a franchisor. And um, our next presenter and speaker, Valerie, uh, is going to talk about finding the right fit, number five um, of the five Fs, and how important this is to set yourself for success once you prepare and uh, you know who you're looking for. Uh, just a little bit of background information and bio uh, for Valeri. He's been in sales um, in corporate sales for eight years now. He joined Fantastic Services three years ago and he's the VP of Development of Pres and President of Expansion, and Vice President of Expansion. He's also been the CMO of a company called The Valando, uh, which is a SaaS company. Um, and he's participated in global worldwide franchise uh, exhibitions. So uh, without further ado, I present to you Valeri Kozara from Fantastic Services. Ooh, thank you very much for the warm welcoming, Danny. It's been, um, it's been a great pleasure to be here today. And before I actually start, I've, the first thing that I want to say is to express a gratitude towards the organizers of uh, today's event. I know how difficult it is to navigate and to organize such conferences and to give such, such massive value to the audiences. So hats down to you guys. You've done a tremendous job. You know, I've, I've really enjoyed the interactions with the organizers. Great. Okay. So my bread and butter, um, finding the fit. Uh, do you mind if I share uh, the screen, Danny, right now? No, please go ahead. Awesome. Perfect. Okay. Great, because I know I've put some great pictures on my presentation. I'd like to kind of show them off. <laughs> so the bread and butter about um, the things that I do and the reason why I'm doing it is because I'm, I'm really enjoying finding the fit for fantastic service. And I've helped more than 20 people actually launch and start um, a franchise within the fantastic services organization. And the most interesting part for me is number one, finding different people, finding multiple people, finding interesting people, you know, finding out the reasons why they actually engage in the first place with a franchise company. What are the reasons to actually, you know, want to improve their situation, their circumstances surrounding their current life. And I've met amazing people, not only in the UK, but all across um, uh, the world because Fantastic Services is operating on three continents, right? We also have master franchisees um, in Ireland, in Hungary, in Bulgaria, in Australia, and so on and so forth. And we have more than 35 area development franchisees who are operating under the actual country master, right? Besides that, Fantastic Services has seen tremendous success in finding out the owner operators, the, the ones that we call them, the actual service providers, because Fantastic Services at the end of the day specializes in service provision for the home and office, in particular cleaning and maintenance services. This is what we've been doing for the past 13 years. We have the technology, we have the know-how, we have um, uh, the infrastructure, everything's in place, all the business tools to make us successful. And as we can see, we've been pretty much successful across the globe. Great, enough about us. I'm here to build value, not to kind of boast about who Fantastic Services is. This was just an informative slide. Now, down to the actual key points of today's presentation. And number one is you need to kiss a lot of frogs to find your prince. And I know this may sound like funny, but I'll get into point in a second. The second thing, the second point that I've, you know, kind of learn from my experience in the past three years that I've been doing this is you need to kind of spot the red flags. And I'll tell you how I actually spot, am spotting the red flags from the different candidates. Number three would be candidates that fit and what gives them away, right? What are the green flags actually that would, how does a good candidate look like? And number four is my secret sauce is that 
the task reward system that I'm using in my franchise recruitment process and why it's important and how does it help you in your recruitment process. Now, I've spoken with multiple um, franchise consultants and all of them are saying, um, you know, the, the message, you need to kiss a lot of frogs in order for you to find a prince. And what does that mean? Well, you need to speak with a lot of people before you actually find a person that you can trust with your brand um, for that particular region, right? You need, and there isn't, um, you know, it's not a coincidence than the percentages that you're seeing on the screen, 1% versus 99%, because on average, the conversion rates for um, uh, a franchise company is just 1% of the generated leads are actually converting into actual franchisees and we kind of sign them up on license. And there's a particular reason for that, right? Yes, you could be um, you know, using different strategies and different sales tactics and negotiation tactics and so on and so forth. You may be pushed to 3%. Maybe, you know, but on average for the entire world is 1%. And it's not the franchisor's fault. Everything is in the hands of the actual candidates that are coming across to you, right? The 99%, as I like to call them, but, uh, you know, from my time when I was um, working in the US, those are the tire kickers. Those are the guys that are just coming, that's interested, you know, both, both parts, you know, bo both categories are starting from the same emotional place. I need to change, right? I need to change my circumstances. I need to change my position. I need to change my, you know, life somehow. I need to do something. But the difference is down the line, down the franchise recruitment process, down the researching process, the 99%, they just say, yeah, but that industry is not good enough. The model is not good enough. I don't have enough money. I'm not the right age. I'm not this, I'm, I don't have enough connections, I don't believe in myself, I don't have the right skill set, and so on and so forth. So they're saying all the things to kind of disqualify the actual company, while the 1% are kind of keep holding and keep following the instructions and keep on, you know, uh, uh, following their gut and they say, yes, it may be difficult, but, you know, I'm going to put the 100% from me to make it work. I really want to make it work, right? And how do you spot the 1% people qualification between the 99%, right? How do you find the 1%? Well, number one is you need to be looking for the red flags, first of all. And some of the red flags that I'm, red flags that I'm kind of observing during the interviewing process is, number one, that's disrespectful behavior, right? If a candidate shows up um, because for the past couple of years, obviously due to known circumstances, you know, the whole world is on Zoom. Right, video calls all over the place. Right, I'm I'm kind of more of a people person. I like you know meeting people face to face, but because of the circumstances, that was impossible. And yeah, video calls. So if a candidate shows up to me and he's from his vehicle, well, that kind of sends me a message that this guy does not want to pay the proper time and the proper attention towards everything that I want to tell him. Right on that particular interview, if he's distracted, if he's on public spaces and so on. So I'm not talking about public ca cafes, right? Because that's something different. But if he's on the move, he's something doing something, you know, in particular, he's doing that interview in the meantime, well, that's a red flag for me. He doesn't kind of take it serious, even though he may say, yeah, this is, this is super serious for me, but I'm not looking for what he's saying. I'm looking for the behavior, right? The number second point is the dishonest answers that they're giving me about the reasons that they're on that phone call. And I want to know that reason, right? Because I, at the end of the day, I kind of value my time and I want to be spending my time with people who actually want to get productive, right? Number three is unrealistic expectations about the potential growth, the profitability, the um, uh, uh, return of investment and so on and so forth. The unrealistic expectations are coming from two things. Number one, They've spoken with the wrong people. Number two, they haven't done any research on us or any franchising uh, uh, companies or any franchise models in the first place. Again, that's a red flag. You don't come to a meeting unless you've done some homework. You know, what are you doing on that meeting, right? And that's the, the next point. No research done prior to the meeting. If you don't know who fantastic service it is or what kind of services are we providing 
then you're wasting my time. You're wasting your time as well. And this is, again, a major red flag. And this is communicating to me that I can't trust you because you don't value your time as well. All right? Now, the next point is refusing to complete any tasks given, right? And this is part of the franchise recruitment process that we've introduced is to give them small tasks just to kind of see whether or not they can follow instructions. Because at the end of the day, a franchise company is following instructions, right? We'll give you specific steps. And you as a candidate, as a master franchise, you're an area development franchise, you're an owner, operator franchise, you need to follow specific instructions. There are specific processes in place, right? And if they refuse and they're saying, for example, if I give them, okay, you should be making like a small research on the area that you potentially would like to you know, invest in. And if they come back to me and they say, yeah, but isn't this actually your job to make the research? And I'm going to be like, yeah, but is it going to be our business to be running? You know, at the end of the day, are we going to take the, the, the profits from the business or are you going to be taking the profits of the business? And then, and then they go silence, crickets. You know, so this is, again, a major red flag. If you don't want to make research or, you know, do a research for uh, 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 the business that you're going to be investing in, then uh, what am I going to be expecting from you? If you're that's if that's the behavior that you're showing me at this point, how can I trust you and how can I put you through our system and how can I put you through, you know, our network? Right. Now, what about the candidates that fit, actually? You know, those are much more rare than um, uh, 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 the ones that don't actually fit. But sometimes, you know, people who don't fit are, you know, actual wolves in sheep skin, right? So they kind of may give the right signals. They may, you know, demonstrate the ability that they are the right fit. But at the end, they, they can disqualify themselves based on the franchise recruitment system that I'm going to kind of introduce to you in the next slides. But number one is eager to complete tasks. They're saying, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm totally down with you. You know, I want to follow, I want to learn, I need your guidance, I don't know what to do, give me specific points for me to uh, 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 follow in order for me to be able to complete a task. I've had candidates who've actually sent their complete, completed task on the same very day <laughs> that we con conducted the first interview. And this is, you know, a major green light that is showing to me, right? asking meaningful questions and those type of candidates are and by meaningful questions i don't mean okay what's the profitability on the uh, 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 on on the model but actually what kind of candidates is fantastic services looking to attract that's a meaningful question right how do i know if i fit the criteria for the great candidate that fantastic uh, services is looking to attract right that's a great question how do i know if I'm winning, that's a great question. How do I know if my business is doing great? That's another great question, right? Those are all productive questions. Those are all how to, and those are all focused on productivity. You know, those are the meaningful questions that are kind of bringing, you know, green flags in my mind when I'm speaking with candidates that are asking me. Point number three is these guys are doing the due diligence even without you having to tell them, right? They're coming prepared. They know who the company is. They know what we're doing. They know where we are. They know the business model somehow. They've read our blog, for example. They've read your blog, for example. If you're also a franchise, you're looking at, at this presentation. And, you know, they're giving signals that they've invested their own time into exploring, into, you know, doing their homework of who you actually are. What are you doing, right? Are you working with domestic clients? Are you working with commercial clients, corporate clients? What is your model, right? They're coming prepared. And number four is they're getting ready mentally and emotionally for the road ahead. Because a lot of people are coming with the wrong expectation. They're thinking, okay, I'm going to buy a franchise and the franchise company is going to do all the work for me. Well, no, nah, it's not going to happen that way. And they fail miserably, right? They, 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 they land flat on their faces. And I've seen that, you know, it's a pity. Um, starting a franchise does not mean that it's going to be easy. It means that you're going to be having a guide, you know, somebody to guide you, somebody next to you, somebody to give you support, somebody to kind of uh, 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 give you and have all these hard questions, uh, all these hard conversations that you're not going to be having if you're, you know, a solopreneur. Let's just call it like that. Right. But it's still you need to be putting all the work. You need to be doing all uh, following all these instructions that the people that the, the franchise company is going to, um, you know, provide you with during the onboarding process. 
Now, another thing that we as franchisors is we need to kind of dig deeper into our candidates and find their emotional why, right? Why are they on the meeting today with us? Why are they want to, you know, why do they want to put all the time into exploring that opportunity with us, right? Their emotional why, you know, all people are buying based on emotion. However, they're looking for the logical part to justify their emotion, right? Because at the end of the day, they're going to have difficult conversation with their spouse and their spouse are going to ask them, okay, give me the reasons why, why you want to do that or why you want to go ahead with that company. What makes it so good? What makes it so great? I know, I know, you, I know you have the vision, right? <laughs> Just give me the logic right now, you know, convince me why this company is the right, the right one for you. Or maybe you have a business partner or maybe you need to convince invest, investors. And all these investors are going to be looking for the justification, the logic. Right? Dig deeper behind there, I want to start a business. Okay, what makes you want to start that business? What makes you excited about the business? That's the emotion, right? How important it is for you to make it happen? That's the emotion, right? How urgent it is for you to make it to, you know, to start? Is it going to be in the next three months? Is it going to be the next one month, right? Is it going to be in the next three to five years? Again, emotion, we're looking. And then back it up with logic. So at the end of the day, we as franchisors, you know, make the mistake that we sell the logic, big brand, customers, easy to follow system, you know, that's the logic. But what's the emotion? And you need to find the emotion in front of the candidate, right? In the candidate in front of you. Task reward system. And that's the task reward system that I've also kind of implemented into our franchise recruitment process, right? And a lot of people are thinking it's sales. Well, I don't think it's actual sales, it's recruitment, right? If it's a sales, then you're not setting up people to success, right? But when you recruit, that's a different route. You are, recruitment means disqualification of certain candidates. Sales means you're selling to everyone, right? And with, kind of implemented that system in order for us to kind of take away the subjectiveness of the franchise recruiter, right? Because many times the franchise recruiter is convinced that we found the fit based on just one interview. Great. He's a great guy. He told me all the right answers. He gave me all the right, uh, 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 he gave me the right attitude. He was, you know, showing respect. He came prepared and then we never heard of him <laughs> again, <laughs> right? So one task reward system is meeting one, we engage into a you know, conversation, we give some sort of information and we tell them in order for you to have access to the information that we provide on the next meeting, here's a small task for you to complete. Should you complete it, send it over and we'll schedule the second call where I'm gonna you know, give you more of the things that you're interested in, right? I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna feed you more of the information that you're needing to find and to make your research, right? And now, if the candidate is great, you know, this is a kind of test for him if he can follow instructions. Because at the end of the day, you, you're looking for people who can follow instructions, right? That's what we as franchisors are looking for. The greatest candidates follow instructions, right? And then meeting two, we give them the reward is the information that they are looking for in order for them to make their due diligence. And again, a small task at the end of the second meeting, which kind of leads to meeting three. And so on and so forth. So I understand it's kind of oversimplified, right? But I hope you get the point what I mean by, by saying that that's the task reward system. So, yeah, I can talk with hours and hours and hours about that topic. Um, I believe I've hit my time um, already. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed my experience. This was my personal experience for hundreds and hundreds of different interviews for international or local or area development franchisees that I've had. I'm really passionate about that, um, uh, that topic. Fantastic Services is also negotiating for a couple of candidates for the Middle Eastern market and Saudi Arabia and Dubai in particular. So I'm also open-minded for the rest of the Middle Eastern countries to kind of speak with. We also have our office in Egypt. Right? We have a call center, we have people there, situations, so on and so forth. So we're ready for business, guys. Thank you very much for your time.
Thank you, Valerie. Your presentation was great. I love the part about the emotional side of things and uh, what is the emotion of the candidates as well, because very often uh, it's all about logic and business and being crude. But uh, what is the actual emotional driver, which is uh, for the long run, is uh, very important. So we've got a few questions from the audience, guys. Um, again, thank you for the brilliant presentations, both very informative. Um, some of the questions are open to both of you. So I would first ask Elias and then uh, Valerie, you can answer too. So someone, someone from our viewers asked how many franchisees you've got. I'm not sure if as to they mean masters or they actually mean franchisees. So maybe you can answer both. So... Um... As I was saying during the, the presentation, we have a presence in more than 45 countries. Some of them are direct countries. Some others are uh, countries managed by master licenses. I would say the 90% is, uh, of the 45 countries are master uh, licenses. And um, for the franchise um, volume of our network, I would say something around 1,700, more or less. Thank you. And Valerie? Yeah, those are all great numbers. So Fantastic Services currently have three masters at the moment. We have one master deposited for Nigeria. We're, you know, looking forward to kind of onboarding this or next month. Um, so we're going to, you know, grow with another master. I'm currently negotiating with Georgia and with Saudi Arabia. Uh, so two new potential masters for, for us to kind of join in, in, in this particular year. In, in regards to the air development franchisees, the number currently is 35. And the own operator franchisees is more than 530 across the globe. Okay, so both have a very, a very well-developed uh, networks of franchisees and masters are counting. Okay, the next question is for Elias. Uh, what is the minimum outlet size? So I'm, I'm suppose they mean the, the minimum center and or shop size. Is there a minimum? Do you have requirements? Yeah, uh, in order to limit the, the fixed cost, because, you know, the, the first goal of our master licenses is to reach the break-even point within the first year, okay? So uh, one of the ways to do it faster is to limit the fixed cost that you have at the beginning. So we won't aim at having a huge location as of the pilot store. Generally, the, the, the size of it is between 70 to 90 square meters. Of course, you have some exceptions. So if I take the examples of Brussels, uh, they have a store of more than 300 square meters. Uh, but again, the average is somewhere between 70, 90, 100 square meters. Okay. And one other thing which I can add on top of this is that we are not located in the hyper city center of the city. Okay, because at the end, our, our core clientele are B2B clients. Okay, so it's not like if you have a, a retail shop with 100% B2C clients and you have to be in the main street uh, of the city. So, uh, in a, for example, in Paris, uh, l'Avenue des Champs-Élysées. It's not like this. So we can be in uh, industrial areas. We can be, what we look for is really the proximity with businesses, the economical activity. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Val, a question for you. How long does it take to realize investment or basically break even with, master, with masters? Yeah, the break even point is between six and 12 months time. So this is a pretty much um, that what we've seen with on average numbers with our own master franchises. For an area development franchise, that's much faster between the six and eight, time, uh, eight months. Um, so the full return of investment is not, not longer than 24 months. This is what we've seen based on our experience. And Elias, how about yourself? As I was saying, the goal is to, is to break even within the first year. Then as, as always, you have some people, some master franchises that do it uh, before. So again, to take the example of Belgium, they did it in the third month in the middle of COVID. Uh, but yes uh to be conservative we say one year it can be a bit longer depending on many factors the economical situation the the sanitary conditions many different factors and okay. we don't know how motivated the franchisees are going uh, to be of course you know, uh, of course actually wanting to succeed because we've seen that pretty much the motivate with with us you know that based on you know my observations pretty much the 
the more motivated franchisees, they don't care about the circumstances surrounding the economy and surrounding the, um, you know, um, outside factors. You know, they just, you know, nail it and just, you know, go out there and take the business. They don't take no for an answer. So. And that's the spirit we'd like to see. Uh, a question to both of you, gentlemen. I think um, you've uh, generated some interest uh, about the franchising opportunities. What are the ongoing fees? How do your royalties and marketing fees work? So um, let's take it one by one. Valerie, do you want to answer that first? And then Elias? Yeah, um, depending on which business model that we're talking about. But if we're talking about the um, master license, we're talking about a flat fee of 8% from the country management, uh, from, from the country branch, right? And that 8%, uh, 8% is kind of split between 7 plus 1, 7 being the actual management fee, and 1% is the global marketing uh, uh, campaigns fee that we're actually generating. And on a separate note, um, the actual master licensees need to kind of invest on the local or country marketing campaigns and so on and so forth down the line. Of course, marketing um, is so important after that to make sure that you build that network once you buy the territory. Elias, what about you? So as Valerie said, I think it's it depends on, uh, on which type of, uh, of business opportunity business opportunity we are talking about for the master franchise it depends on, on on the country we are we are targeting because each country has a specific potential so of course the value of the territory uh, cannot be the same between uh, uh, a country like malta and a country like france for example so there is this part which is linked to the potential of the country. Generally, what we do, Danny, is that we ask the candidates to sign an NDA, which is a non-disclosure agreement, and then we show them all the financial aspects, which means the initial investment, the cost structure, and the revenue stream. So this is for the master franchise part. Then for the individual uh, franchise opportunities or area franchise, it depends on the master licensee, because the master franchisee is the one who sets the, 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 the entry fee, the training fee, uh, and all the royalties. So, I mean, in case somebody is interested for the Middle East area, they can always contact me and I will connect them to, to the master licensee to discuss it more in depth. Thank you. And one last question, because we are limited by time. The question from another viewer is, do you have the same franchisee selection criteria for single site franchisee versus master or area franchisee? Question to me? Uh, for both of you, actually. Okay, so uh, very quickly, uh, I think the master franchisees has more implications because we are talking about a countrywide business opportunity. So of course you should take more validation steps. So in our case, for example, they meet an existing master franchisee, this master franchisee, because in the past he was in the same uh, situation as this, uh, as this candidate, they can give, uh, he can give us a feedback on the candidate. They also meet our board of directors, they have to present their market research, their business plan. And as Valerie said, I think the tasks uh, system that you put in place is super important really to evaluate first the quality, but also the interest of the, uh, of the candidate. But in any case, even for a single unit uh, franchise opportunity, I think there are some musts. Okay, so some, uh, some indie, uh, must have a task such as a business plan, first of all, not only in franchising, in all the, the, the um, entrepreneurial uh, opportunities. Thank you, Elias. Val, do you want to add anything to the answer? Yeah, um, I believe those are two different profiles when we're talking about a master in um, a franchisee that is going to be working beneath the master or you know, within the uh, network of the master franchise because the master at the, at the very beginning is the one who's um, you know establishing the brand in the country right so yeah the, the franchise company is going to give you all the systems is going to give you you know the, the structure is going to give you the uh, uh, um, software infrastructure and so on and so forth but it's going to be up to the master to actually adapt it to the legal and economic uh, uh, legis legislation 
for that particular country. And we're not talking about, um, you know, only in the Middle East, we're talking about the entire globe, you know, it's different culture, different business, different, you know, everything is different than, you know, the countries that we're currently operating in, UK, Australia, Ireland, and so on and so forth. So he needs to be a little bit more um, uh, comfortable taking risks because it's riskier to kind of take a master license that, rather than taking uh, a license beneath the master licensee. So that profile needs to be a little bit more, um, you know, comfortable with the risk, right? The people that are the people that are going to be recruited below the actual master, you know, everything's going to be set up for them, right? Those are the guys who actually don't like the risk that much, right? And they are a little bit more different breed, a different profile than the actual master licensee. So yeah, I believe there is a bit of a difference between. Absolutely. The short answer of this question is no. Those are two different profiles and different criteria are applied. Gentlemen, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you very much for your time. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have much time. So I'd like to um, uh, thank you. Thank to all, all the um, viewers uh, that took part in the webinar. Please save the next date on your calendar because there's another webinar that's very interesting coming up. And that's on indoor entertainment franchises in the GC region. Thank you, Val. Thank you, Elias. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, the Franchise Talk. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe.